Okay, uh, I'm very happy to welcome everybody here. Uh, uh, the title of tonight's session is um, The Management of Identity and Personal Information on the Internet. Um, I think there's a really interesting uh, turning point um, in, the, in identity management, and I stand to be corrected, and I'm sure I will be corrected, but I do think that it's just becoming really quite uh, significant now. While, while several years ago when some of the research at the OII was begun in this area, uh, it was a, sort of a new, newer issue, but now it just gets getting bigger and bigger, but also a turning point because it seems to be a stage at which it's moving from uh, hashing the issues out again to actually beginning to try to agree on the standard or which path are we going to take. So I think that's the most exciting thing about this point in time. Uh, so it could be very critical. Um, I'm Bill Dutton, director of the OII. Uh, we began to, today with a, with a uh, uh, conference over at, uh, a workshop over at the OII uh, on identity management that was sort of initiated by a research project. One of the first ESRC research projects the Oxford Internet Institute received. Miriam Lips and John Taylor uh, were the principal investigators and it was on the management of identity online. And uh, they are just actually now, after three years, completing that project, and they had sort of a wrap-up session, and, and they're working on the final report. And so today was a, uh, a great occasion to sort of bring together that work with other ESRC research projects and related e-government and identity management projects. Um, and we thought we would join that event with an event that will be held tomorrow uh, which will it'll be supported by JISC and uh, the Information Commissioner's Office, which will also look at identity management, and we've, we've got an invited group over at the OII tomorrow for that. So, uh, but this evening, uh, we'll have a, uh, I think we really have an extremely authoritative panel. Uh, I'm really honored that people have, uh, uh, our choices have agreed to come here and, uh, and share their, their perspectives. Um, we're being supported, and I want to thank uh, the Information Commissioner's Office, uh, JISC, and the Cybersecurity Knowledge Transfer Network of DTI for supporting this evening's event. Um, it will be publicly accessible. There's every, anyone was welcome to this event, but also it will be webcast, so uh, be alerted. We are recording it, as long as people stand at the podium or at the desk, and uh, we'll. Uh, not, it's not live, it will be uh, webcast, uh, we'll have an edited webcast next week so that uh, uh, we can erase my, me and, and uh, any of the other things. And that after this event, I think this will go till at least 6 o'clock and uh, we'll have a reception here in this room. And so we can stay for another hour or so after, after the event and uh, have a more informal discussion. So it's my honor uh, simply to introduce the chairman of tonight's session, uh, Jonathan Bamford. Um, you all have his bio, so I'm gonna keep this short, and I, I just, he is the uh, assistant commissioner in the office of the information commissioner, so it's absolutely terrific. He has been very helpful in putting together tomorrow's program and help, uh, suggesting people sh who should be invited and in also agreeing to chair today's session. But um, I guess the one thing I could say that is not on the program is, is as we were discussing this whole session, the one thing he kept holding our feet to the fire with is, is that I insist that this must be balanced. It must, we must address privacy and data protection. It's not something that might go. It's like uh, it kept, kept pushing us back to saying we can't just consider the efficiency and uh, delivery of services, it has to be addressed in the context of a requirement for privacy and data protection. So, Jonathan, thank you for chairing this session. That's okay. Uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you for the kind words of introduction. As you say, all my personal data is available in the biography there, so you, you know what my background is. The way that we're going to structure today, really, is for me just to say a few introductory words, because I wouldn't want to deprive the speakers of the time that we have available and to actually make presentations, short presentations. Once they, in turn, have, have said a few words, I hope to throw the matters onto the floor for discussion. We can answer a few questions here then and hopefully finish in time for, uh, for reception where maybe the more bashful of you who haven't wanted to raise a question in open discussion can have an opportunity as well to discuss things. 
One point that I would make clear, and it builds on what, what Bill's really, uh, Bill said really is there, that um, you know, we in the, the data protection community, the data protection regulatory community um, around the world, have, have really started to see identity management as an opportunity really for delivering some privacy and data protection benefits. And maybe we've been slow to wake up to this, I don't know, because a lot, not all of us are technologists. But we do see there's great potential for actually enhancing privacy and data protection compliance by delivering privacy-friendly solutions to managing people's personally identifiable particulars. Um, when you start to do that, you start to reduce the privacy risks that go with lots of information being held about us in lots of different collections with powerful identification numbers which tie information together. We want to try and make sure that personal information is only used in appropriate ways, Minimates, minimizing the, the extent of personal information that's um, available in various disparate collections around the place. And if possible, putting individuals back in control of their personal details. I think that's an important point. All the surveys that we do, and I think um, others, have shown that individuals are feeling increasingly that they've lost control of their personal information. They're increasingly worried about that. So I'm really pleased that the Oxford Internet Institute and the leadership that's shown by Bill and his colleagues has actually organised this. And we're really pleased to lend our support to it because we do think there's some great value in actually stimulating discussion, fostering debate. See, one problem that sort of appeared to us is that we have lots of people talking to us about potential identity management solutions. And we have lots of organisers of various new policy initiatives talking about what they want. But trying to get the two sides to talk to each other in a common language that they both understand is a real difficulty. It's a real difficulty for me understanding the language sometimes, I must admit. And I often beg the question, well, when people talk about identity management, what, what do they really mean by that? It can mean lots of things to lots of different people. I know from my point of view what I, I mean by that. That's an opportunity to deliver those benefits that I just mentioned to you before to reduce privacy risk. We're keen to foster the sort of discussion um, between the various aspects here to really sort of bridge the divide between those who have got novel, new identity management solutions that do provide a lot of benefits, um, foster the discussion between those and the policy implementers who actually have opportunities to put these into practice and to actually consider these and consider the privacy benefits and what's worthwhile in doing this. What I want today, and hopefully with a discussion tomorrow, to achieve from our point of view as the Information Commissioner's Office, is really try and get that dialogue going more so that, that range of interests is actually um, talking to each other and we, we do start to recognise the common benefits and do start to talk that common language. Knowing the distinguished panel of speakers that I've got on the left of me here, I'd be absolutely astonished if we didn't manage to stimul stimulate that debate this evening because we do have some really, really interesting speakers, and I do thank the Institute for bringing them together. It, it, it's, it, it's really going to be very, very interesting and very helpful. Our first speaker this evening is going to be Sir David Normington, and Sir David is the Permanent Secretary at the Home Office, and that's a Whitehall department that touches the lives of all of us who live in the UK, and all of us who visit the UK who are not UK residents in many ways. And um, the Home Office in the UK needs no introduction in terms of its range of responsibilities because it's, it's seldom out of the headlines. I think the Home Office interest that, 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 that's of particular relevance here, of course, is the, is the work that's been done on identity management through ID cards, the National Identity Register, National Identity Registration Numbers. And um, the, I'm sure Sir David's got some particularly pertinent <coughs> points to say about that. But he's also at the centre of the government's approach to identity management because he chairs the Whitehall Identity Management Steering Group. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Sir David's got to say in the next few minutes and invite him to the podium. Thank you very much. It's, um, it's always uh, daunting to be uh, uh, introduced as, you know, got really interesting speakers. I always think you should say that after <laughs> words, really, just in case we're not. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but thank you for inviting me, and I'm very keen to engage in the debate. Um, I think I'm here for uh, a number of reasons. Um, one is because 
I've been a public servant for 34 years in a number of government departments, most recently in the Home Office, before that in the Department for Education and Skills, where I was the Permanent Secretary for, for four years. I, I've got a passion for improving public service. I think that public services have improved out of all recognition um, in the last uh, 30 years, uh, and yet every time we improve them, public expectations rightly run ahead of um, where we've got to. Secondly, I am, as you heard, currently the Permanent Secretary at the Home Office. Um, not a quiet uh, job. Um, been there for 18 months, and it's been rather a turbulent time. We are the department charged uh, by the government with delivering a secure national identity scheme and the ID cards which will go with it. And thirdly, as you heard, I chair this Whitehall-wide identity strategy group which brings together senior players from national government departments and shortly local authorities as well with an interest in identity management. And the aim is to make a reality of a cross-government approach to identity as a means of improving services to the citizen. Now, I'm certainly not going to give you a technical talk today. You'll be glad to know. I'm going to try and make it um, simple because, after all, I can only understand it in those simple terms um, myself. I'm going to give you a policy perspective, and of course, because I'm a civil servant, it'll come as the government's um, perspective. It's the government's solution to identity, which is to introduce a national identity scheme and ID card. So I'm going to come at it from that, I'm going to explain why that is um, being proposed, what the arguments for it are, and also address some of the risks and concerns. I want to argue, um, as I think the government would, that a secure identity is a right we have in a free society. It's a right, um, and it can be taken away from us, and often is. And if we can deliver a secure national identity scheme, it can meet a multiplicity of needs for the state, for the private and public sectors, um, and for the citizen. Uh, as a civil servant, I have to be really conscious that this is a very political debate. Um, I'm very glad it's being um, webcast. Um, I never know, as the Permanent Secretary of the Home Office, where that means the story will end up, but I'm prepared to take that risk if you are. Um, I know there are deeply held uh, views among public and politicians about things like the costs, the risks, the threat to civil liberties, and so on. I take these issues seriously, and I think we need to debate them. Um, but um, as the person um, responsible for delivering ultimately the government's commitment to ID cards, I'm very aware that we need to allay the genuine concerns if the scheme is to succeed. And if we don't, that will be a problem. It is in the end, of course, for the democratic process to decide whether we should have a national identity scheme at all. All I would say is that uh, whether or not we do, whether or not the public or the politicians on their behalf continue to support a national scheme, the issue of identity doesn't go away um, for any one of us. In, on the contrary. So let me start very simply. Um, well, no one asked me for my identity when I walked in here. I don't suppose they took it on trust that it was me. Um, but I might not be me, of course, but uh, uh, it's a fair bet that I am. Um, increasingly, at conferences, of course, we are asked for our bona fides, and um, I go to conferences on security where that is important. Um, I had to wield my home office um, identity card this morning um, uh, to get the electronic doors to open. Um, because this card doesn't know whether it's me or not. It does activate the doors, but it would activate the doors for anybody wielding this card. So, at times of high security, we have to employ security guards to check the photograph on the card to see whether it's me. I'm not sure that's a good use of, uh, of a card or not, really. Um, I don't know when you were asked last to um, prove your identity and how secure you thought it was. I guess because you're here, you've thought quite a lot about this. You may have opened a bank account, I guess, or applied for a mortgage or shopped online or applied for a passport, which is an interesting experience these days. You used your passport to come through the border or to enter another country. Perhaps you applied for a, a driving license or used the online service to renew your road tax. Um, if you're a student, there's an even longer list, um, including student loans. If you're lucky, lucky enough to look young, um, you may constantly be asked to prove your age in clubs and pubs. 
And, of course, the more we need to prove our identity, it goes without saying the more valuable that identity becomes um, and um, the more, therefore, people want to steal it. Um, and in turn, the rest of us, wherever we work, and whether we're citizens or we're acting as employers or as businesses um, or other um, authoritative bodies, we devise increasingly costly ways to detect, to prevent, and to prove ID theft and fraud. Uh, or, alternatively, we lose confidence in those services um, because we're not sure that uh, they are secure, and then we begin to withdraw from things that are convenient, particularly online services. There's no way of putting this back in the bottle, I would, uh, this genie back in the bottle, I'd say. We live in an age where um, there's mass movement and migration of people, crime is globalized and linked to identity theft. There's a proliferation of inv in invisible transactions. Over 100 million people pass through the UK borders every year, 100 million. Capital moves freely across national boundaries. Information is transmitted digitally. You know all this. Um, businesses have to provide services in unprecedented range, uh, to an unprecedented range of people. It's no longer the corner shop where actually there's a good chance you'd be known. Uh, now it's simply not possible for businesses to know their customers or their employees as they did in the past. Um, employers need increasingly to be sure they're employing the people who have a right to work here. Um, and they need to know whether they're to be relied on. Particularly, as I know from my previous existence in the Department for Education and Skills, if they're working with children or the vulnerable, the checks there need to work. Otherwise, people are put at risk. Across the public sector, we think we already hold each citizen's identity record in an average of 10 places. That's a fraction of the number of records held in the private sector for each com consumer. Each day, hundreds of thousands of new identity records are created in the UK. And that's fertile ground for fraudsters who target victims' financial assets for creditworthiness, as we know. There were 150,000 known inf in instances of recorded, recorded ID fraud last year. It's probably a lot more than that but most, uh, com and most commentators believe that. Elderly people are particularly vulnerable to ID theft, from small insurance policies which were bought decades ago and are left dormant. There's a particularly nasty trade in fraud committed by people impersonating the recently deceased, taking advantage of the de delay before credit reference agencies record that someone has died. We know as consumers that the response to that explosion in identity records and the need to verify identity has so far been very piecemeal. Public services, employers, banks, other organisations ask people to authenticate their identity in different ways. Passports sometimes, utility bills. Um, uh, that's very annoying if, you don't, if you're not the person who um, uh, is the named person on the bill, um, as my wife often tells me. Driving licenses, PIN numbers, various types of card, they're all used with varying degrees of success. Few of them are reliable, actually. Um, using the internet, of course, as you also well know, means having to juggle a growing list of user names and passwords uh, and so on. And people are increasingly worried about the security of all these routes. And my point is a simple and obvious one. As citizens and as consumers, we need to be able to assert and prove our identity with ease and confidence. If we do not have that confidence, we may increasingly retreat from those services which otherwise we would want very much. And for business, at the best, that will mean lost revenue and loss of potential customers. But in the worst case, it means, of course, being defrauded out of millions, or being prosecuted for employing illegal workers. For the public services, it could mean more bureaucracy and less responsive services, everybody doing their own thing. For the state as a whole, failure to have a secure identifier could mean less success against the terrorist and the criminal, and a losing battle against illegal migrants and unfounded asylum claims. Now, therefore, the government's case for a national identity scheme starts here with greater security and public protection. And it makes the case first on grounds of protecting people and the country against illegal immigration, 
against identity fraud, which is currently costing the UK, um, I think it's a conservative estimate, but it is an estimate about 1.7 billion a year. Protecting people against crime and terrorism in which false identities are a central way of evading the law. And against abuse of the vulnerable, um, as I was talking about earlier, by supporting much more effective checks on people working with children. So the argument starts in the government's case with that greater security and public protection. And it is the biometric technology in the na national identity scheme which will make the step change in making our identities secure. In due course, the scheme that is to be developed, and I'll come back to it in a minute, will capture all 10 fingerprints, and it remains an option to use iris recognition as well. So there will be a unique identifier for everyone. Register a false identity and you're stuck with it. Uh, try to register another, and it should be possible to detect through the system that you've already um, registered that identity once. Of course, there's a huge amount to be done to convert <laughs> that identity into reality. Um, and I'll come back to the practical implementation in just a minute. But just to be clear, this is more than some dream. Um, for example, we're already recording the fingerprints of visa applicants in 37 countries overseas. And in a short time, that that's been in place, we already have detected 1,500 people who previously claimed asylum um, or have been fingerprinted for other immigration purposes and were trying to come back into the UK having been prevented or deported. So, I hope you can see already how, in the government's view, a more secure identity can benefit the citizen and the con consumer. But the benefits could be even broader, and I guess we we'll want to talk about this um, uh, in the context of the debates you've been having about citizen-centric services, which have been a theme, I think, or are going to be at, at the workshop that you've been holding. As you know, some of you, the, the, um, uh, this is a theme which underpins um, a report by David Varney on service transformation. He carried out a review which was published last autumn uh, where he looked at public services and how they could be transformed. One of the things he, that shaped his thinking was a study on bereavement where he discovered that in the worst case, a family who'd suffered a bereavement had 44 contacts with public services before things were sorted out. Um, the majority of the 44 contacts involved dealing with pensions, disability allowances and related benefits and nearly half involved the family having to contact the government about the same issue um, rather than the government taking the information once and just putting that right. And this was a bigger problem, this problem of disjointed public services for the most disadvantaged who didn't know how to find their way around the system than it was for the rest. He strongly argued, and I strongly agree with him, that citizens should be able to tell the government something once. And that government should be able to identify a citizen whenever they come into contact with services. That means services are more likely to get it right at first time and be able to deliver the services through a much broader range of channels and technologies. But he also saw identity management as one of the keys to that, what he described as the front end of better service. I know that we will, and I'm sure we'll have this debate, that we will have to prove that a national identity scheme can meet some or all of these objectives, that it can be a repository of personal data, that the safeguards that are built into the legislation that underpins this scheme, including an independent commissioner, are real and effective, and, of course, that we can deliver it on time and on budget. Now, we published a plan, because you always publish plans in government, here it is, um, and you can get it on um, the Home Office's website. Um, and this describes what the national identity scheme is. In a nutshell, it's um, about setting up a system for applying for an ID card, being enrolled, having your biometric data uh, taken. It's then about it being stored in a register, um, which can link to other government systems. It's then about the issue of a card um, to you, with, which holds some of that uh, data. 
It's then about setting up a checking system so you can use that identifier to verify your identity in certain circumstances. And it's also about setting up the safeguards, the security, to prevent the scheme being misused in line with the legislation. It's got those elements. As I say, if you want to read about it in detail, it's quite slim, it's on the website, and um, uh, you just need to go into the Home Office. Just Google Home Office and you'll find it. Um, I just want to stress before I finish five points about this plan. First, there will be a combined application process for the passport and the ID card where we're talking about British citizens. I think it's little appreciated that international conventions increasingly require us to collect and store biometric data for passport holders. So even without ID cards, we would need to and are developing a capability to check and store biometric details for British citizens. Indeed, new passports already contain a chip containing a facial image. So it's not as big a step from the passport as planned in the future to the ID card as is sometimes represented. Of course, you may disapprove of what we're doing on, ID, uh, on passports, but um, that is that you won't get anywhere in future unless the, uh, the passport is like that. It's already will be more and, more and more difficult to get to the States, for instance. Secondly, because of this link with the passports, a lot of the costs which are attributed to the establishment of ID cards would be incurred anyway for passports. The current estimated cost of ID cards, which is much um, uh, argued about, is 5.5 billion over 10 years, plus 200 million for the additional element for foreign national residents coming here to work or to study. 4.3 billion of that is what it will cost to do what I've described in terms of the biometric passport. So it's an extra 1.2 billion, a lot of money of course, but nevertheless over 10 years it's, that is the extra cost of the ID card. Thirdly, of course we're planning to go step by step down this road of issuing cards and on present plans we will issue the first cards to foreign nationals coming to the UK in 2008. 2008, and the first ID cards to British citizens in 2009. Um, it will then roll out progressively as people renew their passports. The government has made it clear that the ID card will eventually be compulsory, but it will need go back to go back to Parliament to ask permission for that before it becomes so. Fourthly, we'll be looking at how we can make use of the assets we are building in the early part of the scheme to test the benefits and also to build public confidence in the, in the value of the card. We said in our December plan that we would look to concentrate on some areas to try to prove the value of this. And we picked out four. They could change, but the four at the moment are criminal records checks, a checking service for employers who are employing foreign nationals, because if they employ illegal workers, they're liable. Retailers requiring proof of age and access to benefits, including those administered by local authorities. Fifth and finally, um, there is a review of potential private sector uses of this scheme going on led by Sir James Crosby. And he has brought together some of those in the financial, retail, airline sectors who need to check identity now to see whether those sectors could, um, in partnership, um, use the benefits of this scheme. And his report may well determine how the scheme develops in the future. As I said earlier, you'll see that some of this is happening now. Um, we already have biometric information on some visas and on new passports. We are already offering secure checks against our passport database, which is very extensive for public services and for private sector customers. There were 250,000 checks in April um, uh, against this database from public and private sector people wanting to check the identity of individuals who they were providing services to. So, I've said enough. I'm just going to try and just sum up uh, what I was uh, uh, saying. I've argued, and maybe it's just the one thing we can all agree on here, that the problems of identity are with us now, and they will grow in importance. And that will put pressure on governments, on employers, on business, and on individuals to respond. 
the government believes that a national identity scheme can provide some of the answers for governments themselves who need a national framework of security for the citizen, for employers who need to check the bona fides of their employees, for businesses who need confidence about the people to whom they are providing services. But a secure identifier could be a gateway to much more convenient, more accessible, more joined up services for government as well, and therefore be a major boost to transforming those services. I certainly don't argue this is a panacea, far from it. A national identity scheme has to prove itself. It has to prove itself with people like you. Citizens will above all need to know that their personal details are highly secure and that this is not a way of keeping more and more checks on them. There's also a potential tension actually between the growing demand which is here now for better identity management, particularly from business, and the need for the identity scheme to be built and tested step by step. On present plans, it will take 10 years to have a national identity scheme fully in place. For some businesses, for some consumers, they need it now. But as I say, and this is a thought I'll leave you, leave you with, the paramount need is to have a scheme which protects and safeguards personal information and in which everyone can have confidence. For the moment, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sir David. Our second speaker today is, going, is uh, Professor Brian Collins, and um, he's one of those people who you, you can quite justifiably says has worn a number of hats and often seems to wear them all at the same time as well. As um, at the moment, he's uh, I think he's been in the areas of uh, an IT practitioner, senior academic, and a civil servant, and he's currently. Chief Scientific Ad Advisor at the Department for Transport, and to prove he wears more than one hat at once, is the Professor of Information Systems at Cranfield University. If that isn't enough, his CV's littered with names like Clifford Chance, the largest law firm in the world, the Wellcome Trust, and GCHQ for good measure. I think his interest in ID management has been around for a while, and I certainly came across him in particular as he was a specialist advisor on the, to the Home Affairs Committee on its inquiry into the National Identity Cards Programme. So without further ado, Professor Brian Collins, thank you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> I'll come back to multiple identities later. Um, I want to move, a, move from the slightly specific that um, Sir David has just talked about with regard to national government schemes and, and talk in a slightly more abstract way about identity and identity management um, as it applies to people, but as it applies to people in their broader context uh, as, as citizens of the world. So I'm going to talk a bit about that and then I'm going to talk about one or two technological developments, a little bit about tokens and biometrics because those are the instruments that we quite often use uh, to interface with uh, the technology, the internet, and after all, it is the Internet Institute that is sponsoring this today. Um, I also want to highlight one or two things to do with the systems view of identity management. It's all too easy to think of the components that make up an identity management system, but not think about the system. Um, and I think we may, I, I want to rehearse that. And then, then offer you some challenges for, to provoke you into asking, I hope, questions. So, first of all, to say a little bit about, well, what are we, what are we talking about here? Identity. Identity of people as individuals, as, as, as um, bunches of, of organic cells that walk around. Um, and clearly, there's a link with biometrics there. But in a socially uh, organized construct, people also have socially endowed rights. And those need identifying. Those rights need identifying. And they need binding to the biological organism, um, but what do you declare when you want to use the rights? Do you declare the identity of the biological organism, or at the point of usage of the right, do you only need to declare that I have a right? And that is quite an important and quite often subtly missed distinction, that you want to remain anonymous when you invoke the right. You may not be allowed to remain anonymous when you establish the right, but you might want to later on. And I've heard that, indeed I heard it when I was listening to the evidence to the Home Affairs Committee, that there are quite a number of groups of people in our society who believe passionately that that is uh, an attribute of identity management that is crucial to them. And I think one has to respect at least the argument for it. 
There are then people who hold roles. And my guess is most of you in this room are work for an organization and therefore have a role within that organization that is similarly bound to you. As you've just heard, I have a number of roles and therefore I walk around with a number of passes, as the, like the one that Sir David just hung out. I have a department for transport one, which looks peculiarly similar, similar to yours, but maybe that's harmonious government for you. Um, but I also have one for the Defence Academy, um, and I have a passport, and I have other things which are to do with my role, um, which similarly are bound to me as a, as a biological organism. I also have things that, that show that I have some authority uh, in certain circumstances, badges of honour. I mean, and, and, you know, we all walk around seeing people who appear to have some authority because of some other identifier that is, appears to be uh, maybe worn by them. A policeman, for instance. Um, you, know, you expect a policeman to be in uniform in certain circumstances. You probably expect them not to be in uniform in others. Um, you don't argue with the, with the guy who's got the gun whether he's in uniform or not. Um, people have choices. How do you invoke the binding of the choice that someone has got, the fact that they have elective rights, for instance, and we haven't talked about online elections, but that's an issue to do with how do you show the right to have choices in, in an elective situation uh, with your identity. And quite importantly, I think you have to include in the, in the context of people, the people who, in quote, society, assert, have transgressed the rules or the laws. And you have to include those in the system of identity management. It's what we might call criminals or other people who we want to pick out as, as transgressing what we regard as socially acceptable norms. Now, if you treat them as special and different, you won't include them in the identity management system. You'll put them outside and try and deal with them differently. And I think it is worth arguing that you actually put them inside the system and then identify them through whatever technique is, might be available to you. And I'll come back to that later. So unpicking identity, I think, is quite an important issue uh, in, a, in an abstract way. It doesn't exclude everything that Sir David talked about, but I think it, it expands to a bigger range of, of topics which it's necessary to talk about. And if that isn't enough, those are the, that's the identity <laughs> to do with people. Now, people go around and leave a digital footprint. So the processes that those identities interact with that are valuable to people leave trails. Now, is that personal information in the context that it's everything I've ever done. And some of the shopping I do online leaves a digital trail on the website of the place that I go shopping. Amazon, I think, keep a record of everything I've ever bought. Um, that itself is, in some context, personal information because it shows some characteristic of me. And of course, they use it, and anyone who shops on Amazon will know that you get a list at the bottom and saying people like you who bought this buy this. Well. Why do I want to know that? And how often have you said, hmm, interesting, yeah, I'll buy that, or not? And you know, sometimes it's irresistible, isn't it? Because um, they're good at it. That's what they're good at. Now, is that personal information? I know it's expanding the context of the private bio, the information that's about me as a biological organism, but it's still me in society, and, and it is therefore usable. Um, and that connects me with, that connection connects me with organizations. I said Amazon has that information. Well, other places I go shop have that information. If they join that up, they, if I don't stop them, if I don't give them consent, or I don't have the choice of giving them consent, can join up a, foot, a set of footprints which sort of makes a, a complete trail of, of everything I've ever done. That's just one example in the internet sense, the mobile telephone records, the phone records, other purchases, the credit card records, we've got digital trails all over the place. Now, are they part of my personal information or not? And I think there's, a, there's a, a context that we, in the future, may need to worry about as to whether you can reverse engineer that to, to do something about me. So there's this organizational personal information relationship contract, which may not be a contract in a legal sense, but it's a social ethical contract that we, we perhaps should be concerned about as well. So I'll leave that hanging as something to perhaps to talk about. And now perhaps talk a little bit more about the mechanics of identity management. Because it doesn't just happen, it's a thing that needs to be managed. And the first thing is that you need to enrol. It's absolutely crucial that the enrolment process can be seen to be as, as, as transparent and as assured as you could possibly make it. 
Um, most of the enrollment processes that I've witnessed in my lifetime have started with the birth certificate as the instrument at the root of the process. Now that is still, in my view, a paper document, comes off a pad, um, and at the moment we're concentrating mm -hmm. on documents from which that is derived as the proof of me being the biological organism I claim to be. Now of course there are records of that, but they're all secondary on top of that birth certificate. Um, and so if you can get to the birth certificate or the death certificate, which is sort of the other end, hence the post-death uh, masquerade, um, you can do quite a lot with regard to upsetting the enrollment process. You've then got to store the enrolled information in a place where it's, it's, it's accessible to those who need to access it, it's safe, it's resilient against damage and loss. You've then got to verify identity information at the point of engagement with someone who needs to be assured that you are the same person as the person who enrolled. Remember the word identity comes from identical, it's the same as. So if you get the enrollment wrong, you'll get the verification wrong and you're stuck with the false identity that you set up. And of course you can do things about that if you don't make the enrollment process robust enough. You do need revocation, um, clearly under certain circumstances. Um, you need to be able to revoke identity. I indicated earlier that the identity management process could include linking of various aspects of identity because lots of things go to make us up. And how you link what pieces of your composite identity is something you need to think about. A designer of an identity management system needs to think about. In particular, where are the consent triggers? Who has consent over certain links being made under certain circumstances? A particularly emotive one is to do with our health records. Now, most of us are pretty protective about saying, well, the only people who really need to have access to my health records are, are the medical practitioners who I can trust to look after me as a biological organism. But if I'm bleeding to death in a gutter in Mid Milan, do I give a damn? I probably don't. I probably want anyone who thinks they can mend me to get hold of anything they need to know and mend me. But 15 minutes later when I'm mended, I then want to revoke it all back again. So there's an issue of real-time consent management in, the, in this nest of identity primitives which I think one needs to think about. That isn't the only example. It's one that most people can relate to because the thought of bleeding to death in a gutter in Milan doesn't excite many people. And then do we allow people to have multiple identities? Should we allow people? Do we have now? Of course we do. Um, some of them are softer than others. Um, and of course they all should all tree back to a, a primitive, but we can use elements of it for whatever purpose we want to. Now is that a right that we should have in a democratic society or not, discuss. And do we have it online? We certainly do. How many people here have persona on Second Life already? Yes, one man owns up, two men own up. Oh, there's more, good, right, okay. So there's issues of anonymity, there's issues of disclosure, how available is identity information when you want it, what are the performance metrics, what do you expect out of it by way of a service? Um, what sort of speed of response in all the stages of identity management we've just talked about? Who do you trust to manage it? Do you trust your bank? Do you trust Sainsbury's? Do you trust the government? Do you trust someone else? And why? Um, and I cannot, hesit cannot resist it. Why do you trust anything you're hearing tonight? Um, well, because we are who we are and you've been told who we allege to be and such like. So each of you will have a different paradigm for thinking about how you go about trusting things. It's a very personal issue. Where is the certification? Who's the body that sits outside all this and says, yes, it's all all right? Should there be one? Is there a sort of ombudsman type function, not only for government, but for commercial exploitation of identity management? Same thing applies to audit. And importantly, because we use the rule of law, for dealing with those people who we say are within society but are behaving unacceptably, we need evidence. And therefore we also need a process in all of this by which we gather evidence at a forensic quality, in other words, stuff that will stand up to challenge in court, that shows that identity fraud has happened. And that means designing it in, because you can't apply that sort of stuff afterwards and it's complicated. And digital forensics is a, one of the most rapidly growing areas of, of computer science, and it's also one of the most difficult in and around this space. Just to put the flesh on, on the bones of that, um, when I bother pe bothered with people with loads of PowerPoint, which I decided not to do, what I've uh, decided to build is a chart which shows some of the intersections between all of these things that I've just talked about. And I'll just touch on a couple to give you an illustration. Um, 
For instance, when you're buying something on Amazon or on any other online site and it clicks to a payment system, or at least what looks like a payment system, and you then are asked to put your credit card details into that second set of windows that come up, how often do you actually check that that second set of windows is what you think it is? And are they, are they keeping a trail of everything you've purchased as well as the vendor who's selling you things? Well, there's lots of stuff and lots of regulation that says that isn't happening. But do you have a mechanism by which you can be assured that your identity is being managed appropriately by all the parties that are involved in that transaction? <laughs> and that's a sort of runtime piece of software interacting with your verification process. And that's sort of the sort of intersection that I'm talking about. Another one is, is perhaps to do with consent. When I give consent for something to happen, how long does that consent last? Like a standing order at a bank or a direct debit at a bank, one of which the vendor can cancel and the other of which you have to cancel. There is different characteristics about consent and longevity of, of people interacting with, with this type of organization. A <coughs> little bit about technology, and then I'll, then I'll stop. A little bit about technology. In transport, we're actually invoking a standard card for payment. In Scotland, bless them, they've already got there. You can use one piece of plastic to buy almost any form of public transport. Um, we're trying to move in this direction in this country. We're slightly um, differently organised in governance structures in, this, in England, so there's a lot more delegated to local government, it's a lot more difficult to do, but we are moving in that direction. Now that is going to leave a digital trail of, here's my card, it left details of my public transport experience on payment systems and billing systems. Now if it's anonymised, that's fine, there's no trail about me, but if I lose it, it's just the same as throwing the banknotes away. So do I want to be able to recover it such that I can be identified as the owner of that card and hence my digital footprint being left behind of all my journeys but I can get the card back if I lose it or not? Discuss. Do I have the choice? Well, in Oyster, yes, you do. But are we going to allow that sort of choice into the future if people start abusing such a system? So David already mentioned a number of things to do with biometrics, fingerprints, face, iris. I won't dwell on those areas. There's quite a lot of public debate about the robustness of the technology. All of them are improving. They're all going to become capable, but how do I couple them together and use them sensibly? Um, there's also an issue of how I build the system robustly. How do I design the system robustly such that it is fail-safe against all the failures that I can possibly imagine? Um, the social acceptability of some of the biometrics, just to go back to that for a moment, is still, in my view, an issue that needs further debate. Um, how much does the majority deal with the, the consequences and the views that are taken by minorities which are a very significant size and very vocal? What is the, what is the common good in this space? And I think that's a, that's a debate that, we're, again, we need to have. So... Really all I wanted to say about technology, because I, I don't want to particularly dwell on, on the technological developments, there's a raft of work going on in this space, um, not only with regard to security, uh, which is what I've just talked about, but also with regard to privacy enhancement, to ensure that you know when you're taking choices and, and when you're making those choices and, and, and about what. I think, therefore, to, to finish, what I'd like to do is leave you with some thoughts to do with some of the challenges. I think one of them is the media, perhaps, in the recent past has tried to present the argument as being either over here, in other words, in a fairly extreme viewpoint, or it's a, 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 a balance between two issues. And I hope what I've presented, and, and by the time we've all finished, you will have understood, is that this is a balance between a lot of issues. It's a multivariate balancing point, and there are lots of issues that have to be taken into account simultaneously and there's going to be lots of vocal, vocal, vocalization about each one of them. And yet, time is running out on us. We do have to improve matters with regard to identity fairly quickly. So there's going to have to be compromises. And an event like this is a really good way of taking forward the process of, 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 of education about that aspect of it. It's important, I think, that there is clarity of objectives of what it is we're trying to identify, not only the people, but all the other things that I've alluded to. And, to take a point that Sir David made, can we categorise some of those objectives such that we can clump them into, into types of objectives so that we can sort of collapse the scale of the problem a little bit? We've got to integrate the services if we do that. Can we integrate those services? Because typically, especially in large-scale IT, 
services are usually best delivered against just one set of objectives. So if you confuse things by saying this will do 16 different things, it probably will do none of them. And yet, we have a lot of reasons for why we want identity management services. There is an issue about the absoluteness of the personal identity. The core atom of, of, of personal identity can't be replaced. Um, so you can't do anything like get another bank card. You can't do that for your own personal identity. And so there is something about the absoluteness. And I think, lastly, I'd like to emphasize the fact that I think we're starting a journey of, of, of debates like this on trust, on trustworthiness, and on consent. I think those are the three big issues for me, rising back above the technology. Um, it's the trustworthiness of the services and, and, and the systems and the processes. It's whether people trust it, even though it is portrayed as being trustworthy. And there's a subtle distinction there, because you don't necessarily trust things that are portrayed to you as being trustworthy. And quite often you do trust things which you know are as risky as hell. Um, who goes bungee jumping, you know? Um, so there's some interesting things about us as, as organisms that cause trust, trustworthiness, and trusting behavior to be really quite unpredictable. But I think the crucial issue is consent, and to have a public debate about where the levers for consent are in this whole malay of identity management is, I think, one of the critical factors to get uh, understood to take us forward. It's not that I'm against identity management at all. What I'm anxious to do is that we do it properly. Thank you very much. He's the founder of the software company Credentica, which is a Canadian company and also adjunct professor at McGill University in Canada. Interestingly, he's one of those people, those brave souls, who have tried to attempt to commercialise privacy and has a couple of businesses to his name there, enterprises, DigiCash and Zero Knowledge Systems. So, Professor Brands, uh, Dr. Brands, come forward. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. OK, I dropped a few things that I'm going to use during my uh, brief presentation. Um, so I've been involved in, uh, in the area of identity management for 15 years, uh, also wearing different hats. Um, so in 91, I started my PhD in the Netherlands. I'm a citizen of the Netherlands uh, in the field of uh, multi-party security. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, that's uh, a, a key thing in, in, that's missing in today's discussions. And, uh, um, so in 94, 95, I started drifting into uh, the business side of things um, and uh, did a lot of consultancy in the Netherlands. And then in 2000, I joined some companies working on early identity management approaches, electronic payment systems, rotol pricing systems, in fact. So, um, and in 2000, I moved to Canada, where I've been since. Um, so uh, as pointed out, I have an adjunct professor, Sibbert McGill, so I teach in, um, in this field, identity access management. And, um, but most, mostly what I do since seven years is discuss with lots and lots of stakeholders, um, ranging from data protection commissioners, uh, reviewing policy papers, uh, writing parts of them sometimes, in fact, uh, and uh, talking with industry. So, so on the industry side, uh, my colleagues and I are extremely familiar with anything that's going on in identity. It's uh, all the initiatives at the bits and bytes level. So I have a very particular deep insight in this area. Uh, what I, so I don't want to talk about uh, technical aspects, however, uh, in this brief discussion. So but, uh, what, what in all these years, what, what's, what struck me, and um, we've been talking a lot with government, in fact, in Canada as well, where Canada has, of course, lots of territories, and they all have, uh, have their own autonomy requirements, and uh, they're all striving at the same time for some pan-Canadian identity management infrastructure, and so it's one big mess. Um, so it's not unlike what's happening elsewhere on the planet. And so, so what, what's, what, yeah, what strikes me is that in, so I'm in, in, in dozens and dozens of, the, of these types of forums, workshops and so forth, uh, since 10 years. And in many ways, it seems there's no progress, right? So, so my, my own conclusion is that the, the, the real problem with these debates is that they're based on uh, on highly, uh, on very, on questions and premises that are wrong. Uh, and I'll give you a list uh, by way of example what I mean. So, so uh, to, to demonstrate why the, these debates are extremely polarized in a manner that, that uh, 
leads to no progress because neither party is wrong, neither party is, is right. There are different requirements from different parties and it's not like you're right, I'm wrong. It's about can we meet all of them simultaneously and that requires a deep, deep insight in technology which is not uh, being put to use today and that goes back to my own involvement in the area of modern cryptography which I did my PhD in um, in the early 90s um, and uh, so because there's a field of 30 years of research that is exactly about, about how can we reconcile seemingly conflicting requirements with regard to security and privacy in a distributed identity management system. It wasn't called identity management when all of this started in the, in the, in the early 80s. Um, this research field, but uh, it, uh, it was just referred to as personal information, right? which is essentially the same thing. So, uh, so let me give you a few examples of, of the kind of questions that, uh, that are being uh, the, the, the topic of uh, very uh, uh, heated debates uh, that won't lead to anything. So one is, well, uh, should we uh, move to biometrics or not? Um, should we have one secure identifier uh, for, for every citizen or not? Um, should, should people be required to en securely enroll in systems to get services or not? Um, should people be allowed to be anonymous or should they be identified? Notice that all of these are binary questions, yes or no. This is why they're all wrong. That's why, why um, should the user be in control of his own data or uh, should organizations be in control of the user's data? Should, uh, if we agree that data sharing um, across organizations, uh, personal data sharing, uh, is useful for various parties, um, that means linking the various accounts of, of, of individuals at the different organizations, otherwise we cannot share data. So basically, either we, share, we are able to share data, um, and, but then we link all the accounts and create common identifiers, or um, we, we don't create the linking of, of uh, creation of common identifiers, and, but then we forego the, the benefits of data sharing, which is totally wrong. That's, not, that's a wrong debate. Um, should we screen, let's say, airport security? We have a blacklist of suspected terrorists. So now, so we could screen, if we give everybody a secure identifier, right? So, so a passport or whatever that, that's more secure. So we could screen their names against the blacklist for higher security, but that means everybody is identified, maybe in some electronic means, right? So basically, should we have a blacklisting uh, approach like that uh, for airports, uh, or is it too privacy invasive? Wrong question. Um, Cross-domain security, which is one of the objectives in, uh, of government, uh, where let's say you commit a kind of fraud here, right? You're, you're basically uh, on welfare and at the same time uh, you have a job and you, you, uh, you generate income. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we can see that you're in both systems, right? Which means a common identifier. Um, wrong assumption. Um, and I actually heard one here which is relating to anonymous payment, road toll pricing, which is one... Um, these are just examples. I can go on for hours, you know. So, um, if if we have a, a rotor price uh, pricing system where people make electronic payments to toll bridges, um, either the system is anonymous, but then people cannot recover their money when their card is lost, or payments are identifiable so they can recover from a lost card. Wrong. You can have everything at the same time. Um, now, let me, because the, the, the real way how to do that gets uh, to be pretty technical. Industry is, in fact, now experimenting with some of these technologies. Um, and let me just quickly go over each of these to give you an indication of, of what's wrong about, about those questions. So, uh, should we have one secure identifier or not? Uh, the real question is, uh, is there a need for what we call breeder documents or credentials? Uh, like, like today, in, in today's world, I have lots of um, what we call authentication tokens, right? So all, the, all of these tokens, they specify information about me. 
Um, so in order to get, let's say, a driver license, I need to show other pieces of evidence. One of those may be, um, uh, well, typically those other documents I obtain as well by showing yet other documents. And so ultimately there are breeder documents. So uh, I'm a big believer that yes, um, uh, having a secure identifier uh, is very, very valuable. The, bi the big point though is, um, how, how is it used? Um, is it used everywhere? Do you show that same identifier everywhere where you go to gain access to services? Or do you only use it to generate other credentials? Like a health insurance card in, let's say, the Quebec healthcare system, which you get by proving uh, other identity attributes. Um, this is how the world works today, right? And so there's no, no contradiction there. A biometric or not? Well, the real question is, is a biometric end-to-end? -end? Do, does my, um, let's say, fingerprint or retina scan or whatever, the template, that unique identifier that's extracted, is that used uh, for me to the service point, right, where they store it to see if I'm the same person? Or do I use it to unlock a chip card of my own that then uh, talks with, with the, uh, the service electronically, right? So, um, so those are completely different approaches. So if you look at a, a pay-by-touch, where some of you may have heard of, uh, there would be a Wall Street Darling. I think they've raised $350 million purely on the idea of we're going to, um, the whole world will, will be able to pay uh, with this. You can't lose it. That's sort of their claim. It's convenient. They have it at Walmart and, uh, and other places already and uh, in the US, so you put your finger there and it's gonna access your account and in the back end, payment uh, will be arranged, right? So very convenient. So does that mean, so, so that particular approach is very privacy invasive once you start thinking about it. Um, but as a user, you could have the same experience by putting it, let's say, on your card and how the card deals with the back end system when it's a chip card, that's, that's done securely through information security mechanism. So you get the same experience and you can in fact get the exact same security without the privacy implications. Um, now, enrollment or not, so that depends on what, you know, if you look at a lot of systems when I let's say open a bank account, some, some of the information they require when they open an account for me and they register certain data on me is actually self-asserted. Other information may be asserted by third parties. So to what extent uh, a company rely or organization relies on self-asserted information um, depends completely on, on the application. And, and, uh, but ultimately, if you think about it, most information that companies have on you out there started with being self-asserted. Well, I mean, there's a big category of that. And what matters to organizations that, is that once it's been self-asserted, it becomes an attribute of yours, which, which they may want to um, bind to you so that you cannot just change it. Um, so, but it, de it depends on, on the application basically. So it's not a matter of uh, is enrollment privacy uh, invasive or not. Um, so the anonymous or identified, that's an important one. Um, anonymous means that I don't give any name when I deal with a service provider, let's say. Um, identify it, but what does that mean? You know, what, when, when I have a username, at, at some online service that I self-generate, that is an identifier. It's, so whenever I go back to, let's say, uh, Amazon with a self-generated username, um, or a variation of my birth name, in fact, if you think about it, my real name is just an identifier, right? It, it has meaning within a particular context um, where it's supposed to be unique and where there are certain um, ways in which other parties would like to rely on it. Um, so my real name is just one identifier. So there are various variations of my name that exist in different systems. So is S Brands the same as Stefan Brands? Who knows? So yes, there are correlations between those identifiers. Uh, but my social security number is yet another one, right? So all of these are different identifiers. So when I identify to a particular system, all they need to know is of all the users in their context, which one am I? so that they can then look up any data they hold on me in their accounts, which account belongs to me. 
So that doesn't mean I need to give them my real name, right? And if you start thinking about it, uh, most identifiers in, the, in today's world, we sort of now, of course, things are changing, are what we call local identifiers. They're, they're not universally unique. There's no, no, ver no guarantee that they are universally unique. There's no verification that they are. And there's no need that they are because they're, they're supposed to be meaningful within a context. Um, so data sharing across organizations. I have, let's say, uh, account information at the bank and I, to get a mortgage, I need to show I have a good credit status, right? So that's information about me that needs to go from here to here securely. Does that mean they need to create a common identifier on me? Well, you know, it, just as an example, and then with the information technology, you can make that way more secure. But these, this is information about me, right? So the idea, I get information on, on a secure card that has authentication marks. I can then pass that to a lying party. Doesn't mean they need to have a, the same identifier on me, right? So and you can mimic this with electronic systems. So you won't see a card necessarily. You can have multiple cards that all sit on the same <coughs> smart card, right? Um, so blacklist screening or, or not is a bit more tricky. Turns out it's actually possible to build a chip card that has a unique identifier uh, for, for its holder, maybe a real name, um, and then to do a very sophisticated cryptographic protocol whereby the card proves to the other party, the airport server, let's say, my identifier is not on your blacklist of names of suspected terrorists without revealing any information about the identifier. You can do that highly securely. So you get the desired effect. This person is not on the blacklist, so he can pass. He's allowed to pass. So, so, and we don't know who he is, but we don't need to know. We just want to know he's not on the blacklist, right? Um, so you can do that. Um, so yeah, so those are just some examples. So I mean, the key is that um, traditional thinking is all about what, what uh, computer scientists call unilateral security. And so in, with the advent of public key cryptography in 1977, 78, at least in the public, um, uh, there, most of the work that cryptographers have been doing is on multi-party secure computations, as it's called where the objective is, can multiple participants, um, let's say you have, uh, have two parties uh, and they want to know which of the two of us is, is older, um, but they don't want to reveal their age. So the, the, basically what this general result says from cryptography is that problems like these, um, if you can solve them with a trusted party that, that has to be trusted by everybody that sits in the middle, <coughs> then you can solve them also without having such a party. So in this case, if you have these, these two people who want to know which of the two of them is older without revealing their respective ages, they could agree on a, on a common party that they both trust with not revealing their age to the other person, and that party will say uh, he or she is older, right? Um, so uh, the, the research that we know that therefore we can solve this problem also <coughs> without having such a party. We do a cryptographic protocol. In the end, both parties will securely know which of the two is older, but they won't learn any information beyond it about the other person's age. And so we can do this, so identity management is just a more general problem statement, which we can solve in a similar way. Uh, privacy becomes one aspect of it, because unilateral security it's really security against outsiders, right? Different participants that communicate, um, let's say service providers, they want to protect against wiretappers and uh, users who misbehave and so forth, uh, but they're not protecting the user against misuse by themselves. And of course, in the electronic world, that's a very bad assumption because hackers and insiders and viruses and so forth can gain insider status. So you have to really uh, make sure that uh, every party is secure against possible attacks from other participants that they talk with. And privacy means minimizing the amount of personal data that, that you send to other parties or that they can learn to the absolute minimum. And we know how to do that, right? So, which means avoiding common identifiers when there's no need for them, which means, um, um, so you, you can securely transfer 
authenticated attributes about yourself without creating linkages. So I'm a resident of Canada. I could be get in a similar way as, as these things over there where I can do digitally, I can show information that's claimed about me by one party to another digitally while actually doing the equivalent of covering up some of the fields I don't need to show so that I just show what the relying party needs to know. And you can do that so that even if they would be malicious and, and the issuer of the state of the card would collude with the relying party and they would have infinite computing power, they still cannot infer more than what you chose to show them, uh, what you choose to show them. Uh, so we know how to do all this. So you know, the debate needs to change. Uh, that's uh, that's the, my key message. It needs to move to more sophisticated level. So I'll leave it at that.